always know there's a big group when I talk about uh, herbaceous perennials, which is uh, interesting since we're known for our woody plants, but I guess our longtime uh, members uh, have limited space for shade trees and things like that. So uh, the perennials um, tend, tend to be pretty, uh, pretty popular. Um, I did not set out to talk about perennials for sun, but I really, that's what I, I kind of, um, when, I, when I put it together, I was looking at my list and um, had hit mostly perennials for sun. Um, so it'll be a lot of those and try to get a, some, some different types of, of perennials. Uh, we're in a great time now. You're kind of the, the spring things are ending, the summer things are starting, so you're getting that crossover from, from things you kind of associate with more with spring and from things that you associate more with, with, uh, with summer, like purple cone flowers and that sort of thing. Um, as always, please add your input, uh, add, uh, add comments when I talk about a plant. If, if you have questions about the plant itself or something else, just, just pipe right up. Uh, you can stop me as I'm walking. I'll, I'll be happy to talk about something that I'm not planning to talk about. Uh, no problem. Um, if I tell you something and you have different experiences, uh, please share it with the group. It's always helpful to, to get kind of a, uh, you know, a broader idea of what works and what doesn't work because there are always some plants that some of us have success with that other ones, others think won't grow. Uh, even, even for those of us who do it professionally, there are some things we just struggle with. So I'd be happy to hear your, your input on those as well. Um, we're going to go ahead and jump right in, get around the corner, and start talking about um, some plants. And like I said, if you have questions, we get going. Uh, feel free to ask. I, I did not do a list like I normally do, and that, that's entirely my fault. It's because I, I played hooky yesterday, was not here, and so didn't get a list together. Um, I know. Uh, but that's okay. That may, maybe that means I'll just talk about different things. I, I'll go as long as my voice holds out. Uh, I'm not sure how long that'll be though, because uh, I've, I've got a little something going on. Um, first plant on the list is a Hebranthus. This is a Hebranthus, uh, uh, Russell Manning is named, and it's uh, one of the really fantastic uh, rain lilies. Usually when you think of rain lilies, you think of Zephranthus. Um, Hebranthus are virtually identical to Zephranthus, except for the Hebranthus always have kind of a, a slightly nodding flower. The, the Zephranthes will be straight up, um, whereas these kind of nod over and look at you, uh, which is kind of nice. Um, Hebranthus robustus Russell Manning has really nice kind of flat grayish green leaves, kind of wider than, than some of the other rain lilies, uh, which makes a nice base for the, these lovely flowers. Really large three inch tubular flowers, uh, yellow, kind of fading to yellow in the throat and the, the um, yellow stamens in, in, the, in the center there. It's a very easy plant, and like a lot of the rain lilies, it will uh, keep flowering over the course of the summer. When we get those rainfalls, you know, have a dry period, and then it'll rain, and they'll flower for you, and then it'll go dry, and then it'll rain, and they'll flower again for you. And really, if they're in an irrigated spot, they'll kind of flower uh, most of the way through the summer. If you put them in an irrigated spot, and so they're getting lots of water, and they're trying to flower all summer, they may need a little extra um, fertilizer, and um, you may want to go through and, and deadhead the old spent um, spent stalks. Just uh, you know, snap them off near the ground when they're they faded. And if you just kind of go through and do that, you know, every few days they will keep going and going and going and going um, nonstop. If you don't do that and you leave them in a non-irrigated bed, they will they will flower. They're extremely drought tolerant. They're they're from the um, southwest uh, down into. Um, South America into Brazil, but in dry spots, put them in rock gardens um, and just let them bake in the sun. And then when it rains, boom, they'll flower and then they'll kind of fade away. Um, they make nice patches. You can divide them up, move them around. They're really nice for kind of uh, uh, interspersing around other other plants. Yes. When would you divide? Great question. Um, <laughs> With the rain lilies, they're not very picky about it. It's not like a, a tulip or daffodil that kind of has one shot and you know and goes dormant early. Since these keep going and going and going, you can do them whenever. Your best is in the fall. That, that's typically your best time to divide. Uh, but you know, there's a lot of tasks in the garden in the fall. So you know, if you were to come out right now and pick some up and divide them, they would. They may not finish. They may not flower anymore this summer, but but they'd be fine. 
We want to put one daylily on there at least. Um, disregard some of the weeds. <laughs> it's that time of year when um, we, we get a little behind in the weeds, uh, but, but uh, we'll get caught back up uh, pretty soon. Um, this is a great little daylily, uh, Dancing Shiva. It's not one that is really widely, widely grown, but it's a very, very good one. It's, it's one that was bred back in the, the uh, early, mid-70s, I think maybe 74, 75, something like that. Uh, and it's one of the early rebloomers. It's a tetraploid, so it doesn't set um, much in the way of seed, and it will keep reblooming. But what I really like about it, because there are better rebloomers on the market now than this. This is kind of one of the really early ones. But what I really like about this one is it is so early. Uh, you know, we've had a very cool spring. Everything's still kind of uh, behind and, and where they're where they are, what's coming up. But this one, you know, this is pretty typical for it. Flower, it's starting to flower this early. And you can see it's already got flowers that are faded. It's been it's been flowering for a while now, um, which is nice with a day lily. If you're especially if you're growing a lot, you get some that that start earlier, and then it will rebloom. You'll get usually get uh, maybe three really good blooms out of it. It's not a kind of a continuous one, but it'll it'll flower, it'll go kind of completely out of flower, and then it'll, and then it'll go again um, later on once or twice. Um, really nice. Uh, same thing with these, dividing them, if you divide in the fall, that's your best bet. You can divide them in the spring if you want, but you'll, that, that'll, uh, while it's reestablishing roots and all that, you'll, you'll tend to have uh, less flowering. Um, one of the issues with daylilies are some rusts. Uh, I tend to be the kind of person who will live with rust, and if it's a really bad, if it's a daylily that gets it really bad, get rid of the daylily. Hmm. But if you want to treat the, the rust on there, and that's what you'll see of the rust is kind of a uh, like spotting and streaking in the in the leaf, um, and you can see this is getting a little bit of that. Um, if you want to, what you want to do is when the foliage is emerging, before you see any rust, you spray it with a fungicide. Uh, and that'll help do it, and you, and you do that uh, several times, just depending on what fungicide you use. But um, I'm really, I try not to recommend just, just spraying indiscriminately. There are 16 gazillion daylilies out there. If you have one that's really bad with rust, get rid of it and get another one. Um, much, much better way to go. This one has not been much of a problem. I've grown this several different places, and it gets some rust, but not bad. Uh, when it, if the foliage gets real bad, I'll cut it all off. I'll throw it away, not compost it. Um, you know, you can replace the mulch, and you just reduce reduce that inoculum and kind of knock back down the levels again. And again, it'll still be there. It's still there in the soil. It's still there around. So you'll you'll see it, but it, it won't be too bad. Um, since this is a rebloomer, uh, you know, you get these flower stalks. They've got lots of different flowers on there. When all the flowers finish, cut off that whole stalk. Uh, they like I said, this is a tetraploid, so it doesn't, uh, doesn't typically set any seed, so you don't have um, problems really with it setting seed instead of, of doing more flowers. But still, I, I think it, it helps it rebloom if you get rid of these stalks and just take them all the way back to the ground. Questions about this or other daylilies? Or rust or anything else? Daylilies are one of those plants that, you know, if you feel like you have a black thumb, you know, plant some daylilies out there. They'll be good. <laughs> Unless you have deer. <laughs> then you just need a gun. <laughs> One that, that gets a lot of comment and has been receiving a lot of questions and uh, a lot of photos uh, since early in the spring is the, the um, giant calla lily here. Xanthodesia ethiopica white giant. And this is a pretty cool plant. This is a small one. Oh. A, a very small one. Um, you know, cow, it's your typical cow lily, only on steroids. It's uh, in the garden in, in uh, a nice, moist, uh, rich soil uh, under irrigation. The flower stalks will easily be five to six feet tall on this. Wow. And the, the leaves will be, the leaf blades will be uh, two, two and a half feet uh, long by a foot or so wide. Just in those, those speckled, uh, the speckled white on there, really fantastic. In in the water, it grows just fine in the water like this. A little bit less hardy in the water, growing in the water, uh, like, like it is right here. Um, 
but you know, you'll see you only get about uh, three feet out of it. Um, but it'll foliage four feet, flowers five, six feet in, in the garden. Um, and you see it likes water. Um, it's good for a rain garden type uh, situation, a place where it, you know, or a ditch where it gets, sits in water, you know, after you have four inches of rain in a couple of hours, uh, like Friday, and then that same spot may dry out and it'll still do pretty well there. If it goes really dry, uh, you'll, you'll sometimes get it dying back some in the summer, going a little summer dormant, um, but if you, if you keep the moisture on it, it'll just keep growing and growing and growing. Like a lot of these plants that, that will get really big, if they get in a really nice moist spot, a little extra fertilizer will really push it as well. Uh, in the garden, um, just when it starts going dormant, just cut it back, cut back leaves as they start to yellow, um, cut the whole thing back in the garden. Xanthodes just can be a little bit uh, marginal. Um, this one's pretty good here in, in Raleigh, but if you get, you know, if you're one of those spots that's just a little bit colder than Raleigh, be good to get a, a pretty good uh, layer of mulch on top of it. Does this one stay in the water all year? The question was, does this stay in the water all year? Um, it did this past winter, and we had a very mild winter, and it was okay. Mm -hmm. We have in other winters, we've taken it back and put it in the greenhouse. You really need to take it out and divide it, plant some in the garden, and put some back in here. So what would you say, zone eight is better for this? 7B. 7B. We're really good, solid, pretty solid 7B. Does it need full sun? Does it, oh, good question. Does it need full sun? Yes, it will be much better in, in more sun. That will tolerate some shade, but you want to get it some good sun part of the day. For some reason, people put calla lilies, maybe because they're, they're in the same family as um, the spathophyllum, the house plant, the, the mm -hmm. peace lily that likes some shade, or erythemas that like some shade, or whatnot. People, I see them listed as shade plants, and they're really not. And you'll get you'll get okay foliage. It'll tend to flop a bit, but you won't get good flowers when you cow them. Moist and sun is really what they want. Other questions? Um, depend, how often depends on the type of fertilizer. So follow the directions on your fertilizer package. You know, if you do just comp, good compost, that's, a, that's perfect. That's all it means. It likes that organic um, um, compost. What I would say with, with things like this, if you just have one or two things that you really want to push in the garden, uh, like say Brugmansia or bananas, things that, that really respond to fertilizer and, um, and water. If you have a, just a liquid feed that you're doing annuals with, like you have containers and things like that, just every once in a while, hit your, your, um, your other, the, some of those other plants you want to push with that same liquid feed, and that's fine. Don't over fertilize, you know, we, we, everything's going and getting into the meat at some point with, here, so you don't want to over fertilize uh, with anything, but you know you can use Miracle Grow or whatever. It doesn't really matter. Okay, got two different um, plants here that look very similar. These kind of grassy, uh, um, equisetum-like plants. They look like uh, uh, horse rush or scouring rush. Which, if you've ever planted that, you may know it can spread and you will never, ever, ever get rid of it. Um, there's a reason that it was growing when dinosaurs were around and is still growing. It's because it, that first plant never went away. It just spread <laughs> all around the world. Um, but these are not that plant. They're, they're not even uh, related at all. They're called restios, uh, the, which is a kind of a group of several genera of uh, mostly South African um, plants. Uh, this one is Elegia tectorum. This is one that we've been really happy with. Uh, this one is Thamnocortis uh, insignis. And um, they're, they're all kind of related to, they're all kind of similar with uh, these um, round reed-like um, um, stems and then little uh, brownish flowers on the top. Uh, really great for texture. Uh, we planted these out not really knowing what to expect. Uh, 
quite honestly, not expecting them to live through the winter. Um, and we've had pretty good success with them. Um, we've had the, the Elysia Tectorum um, under two different names, uh, uh, Chondropetalum and Elegia, uh, both are the same thing. And the them, of course, uh, have been out for, for a couple of years now. Now, we haven't had really cold winters the last couple of years, so we're still a little on the fence for as far as how um, hardy they are. But they're, they're fantastic plants. I've seen them growing uh, in kind of like we had the, the calla lily in, in water um, and doing very well. I've seen them growing very dry uh, and, and doing pretty well. So they seem to, to really respond to a broad range of, of conditions. And we're still just kind of feeling out what, what those conditions are in, in the southeastern uh, U.S. Um, we'll give these a couple more years and see how they do. If they continue to do well, we'll probably dig some up and divide them up and, and start distributing them and, and trying to get them out if, if we get a real Zone 7 winter again uh, and, and promote them that way. Certainly great in, in Zone 8. Um, some that we planted, some of these restios died quickly but but these are two that that have really done well this one i've seen the um the themna uh, themna cordis being uh close to eight feet tall uh in flower really um pretty uh, striking but since they are so drought tolerant they're great in containers and that vertical accent to containers um uh, which sometimes you use uh, uh some of the juncus in these will go a little taller and you get those brown bands around there which adds some interest to it especially when you get them up a little higher and you're looking through them and they are nice because because they do they get pretty full but you can still see through them they're kind of those those peek through plants really uh, kind of fun things do we cut them back um we have not so far uh i think you're going to need to at some point because you're going to get you get this um you know, get dead stuff in there just haven't had them long enough and they you kind of get the same problem you have with juncus is when do you cut it back uh, and so um, what you'd want to do is you see it you see it starting to emerge right now is probably cut it back probably down to about uh, 10 inches um, in early spring as, as the new growth is starting to emerge I would wait until new growth is coming up um, before cutting it back but a little earlier than this you know, when that new growth is is maybe just uh, six inches tall, cut it off right above that. But I'm guessing. <laughs> um, you know, people are used to the big hybrid cannas. Um, this is a species canna, canna patens, um, which stays a little bit lower. Now it'll get taller in a moister soil. It's 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 a somewhat dry spot up here, um, but still relatively small relatively resistant to the leaf roller that can be so nasty on cannas. Uh, a lot of the, the species cannas are much better re resistant to leaf roller. Um, I do see a little bit of leaf roller in here, um, but not much. Um, you can see some kind of nasty looking um, leaves wrapped around in, in there. But this can of flowers very early, really great color. Um, if you deadhead, it'll keep flowering and flowering and flowering. Um, I just tell people again with the leaf rollers, people want to know how to control it. One, there are some cannas that are really susceptible to it, just don't plant those. Uh, but if you start getting a bad infestation of it, just cut all your cannas back down to the ground, get rid of all of the tops, water them, fertilize them, boom, they'll be back up and flowering. You know, when it's hot, you're in the middle of the summer and it's hot and they're growing, they will be back up and flowering within a couple of weeks if you fertilize them and water them. They are just they come back up so quickly and so just get rid of them all that way um, this, uh, I just this is a really nice little canna though for for kind of uh, uh, interspersing around other plants because it doesn't it's not so quite so um, vigorous as some of the, the hybrids which can just spread everywhere and it's a great color you don't get a lot of that that bright deep color uh, uh, this early in the season that's kind of a fall color Questions? Yeah. Any special care for the winter Are you? Did you move here from up north? Yeah. Plant them. That, that's what you need to do to ensure they'll come back through the winter. 
<laughs> we, we, you don't baby cannas in the south. They, they'll, uh, you baby them too much, and, and uh, you'll be having to find a new place to live because they'll take over your house. They, they, they spread. Always, people come down from from up north. Always want to know how what to do with their cannas during the winter. <laughs> digging them up up there, you know, store them in the basement. Yeah, don't do that. You'll be digging them up just to get the clumps a little bit smaller. What do you do with the seed pods? Um, if you want more flowering, you see this is, you know, you're getting another flower spike right here. This is just energy. Anytime you let your plants go to seed, if you don't want the seed as, um, uh, you know, something showy, like, uh, say, the um, blackberry iris, where the seed heads are, are really showy, uh, you, you get rid of those these seed heads. And they can be interesting, but we're growing this sucker for its flowers. So you get rid of these and it'll keep flowering over a much longer period. When when you don't have any more flowers, you know, when this would fade, you can cut it all, you can cut it back down to, some people just cut it down to a leaf to leave all that material. I'll go ahead and cut it all the way back and let new growth come up because it'll keep getting new growth all summer long. So I just do that and that slows it down a little bit. Good for flower arrangement. Good for flower arrangement. Yeah, if you want flower arrangements, you can, you can do these. <laughs> if you do let the seeds finish up, the seed, this is actually, people wonder why sometimes you hear cannas called Indian shot, and the reason they're called Indian shot is because uh, they're from India, um, canna indica, and those seeds are, little, uh, they are hard as rocks, they're little round, almost like BBs. Okay, yeah, yeah, good one. Uh, this is a cardoon, which is a, a, a artichoke relative, Cynara cardunculus. Um, it's technically a biennial, so you'll usually get one year of, of really beautiful silver um, foliage. You get, go buy yourself a little quart plant, and uh, it'll just it'll make this massive thing. And then the next spring, uh, it'll go into flower so you get this big tall thistle it is a it's a thistle relative um flower purple really beautiful the foliage will start to get ragged um if you cut them down before they get too bad you can also often get them to rosette again um but but it's easier just to go buy another plant you know let these go let them get beautiful um what i've seen some people do is when they go into flower like this is they cut off all this foliage which starts to look ratty because the foliage the first year is spectacular you cut off this foliage it starts to look a little ratty and you plant you know annuals whatever around under there or, or you have something else growing up under that with this just shooting up out of the the middle and then when it finishes rip it out and plant a new one how old are those plants two years they're, they're by the biennial mean they'll, they'll they grow uh, vegetatively the first year and then flower the second year and then usually die after that sometimes they'll hang around i've had cardoons that have hung around for for many years but they're usually never as satisfying as a new plant put in and you can usually get them for you know eight ten bucks so do people eat them no, I don't think so. Um, but I'm not sure. There's something in card. There's some part of cardoon that people do eat, but I'm not sure what it is. Yeah, my, my Italian neighbor used to go and get cardoon wherever she found it, planted, and she would make some sort of a like a breaded patty with it. Uh, it was very tasty. So there is some variety that you can eat. Very good. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's definitely cardoon is definitely grown as a vegetable in some areas, but I don't. I, have never eaten it. A good drainage, moist. Thank you. Um, full sun. It's a Mediterranean type plant, so full sun and uh, and uh, good drainage. Um, it'll take average garden soil, um, but it doesn't want to sit really wet uh, at all. It'll and it's very drought tolerant. Part of the reason it's in this little strip along the edge of the roof here. You can see other things we have here are pretty drought tolerant as well. Yes. Yeah, yeah, you can grow up from seed. Would you start it in August? Um, no, I would start it. I would start it in um, late winter. Plant it out in spring, and you get that 
beautiful first year of foliage. It really is spectacular that first year. It just it'll make a mound of just silver foliage, you know, like this. This guy is uh, Syningia uh, bananas foster, <laughs> and it's a it's a hybrid between two other named ones, Syningia Cresdorn yellow and apricot delight, I believe. Um, and it, it is a fantastic plant. These Syningias, these Syningias are African violet relatives, believe it or not. Um, and we're finding more and more of them that grow spectacularly well for us. Just are really outstanding perennials and, and very, very showy. Um, Bananas Foster uh, grows, you see, about three feet tall. This is pretty typical for it. Pretty nice, sturdy stems. Some of the, um, some of these Syningias kind of are floppy. But this has these really nice kind of dark uh, colored stems on there above really uh, glossy kind of fuzzy uh, uh, foliage really not it's really nice foliage plant in itself just just by itself starts flowering in May and we'll keep going if you deadhead these stalks uh, once they really just start stop producing a whole lot if you deadhead them it'll keep sending out new stalks um, just about throughout mo almost all, all summer uh, long it is extremely, extremely drought tolerant. It has a tuber, um, and, which makes it very, very drought tolerant. Uh, it'll take blazing sun and no water. Once you get it established, um, you can just forget about it and, and never water it again, uh, which is kind of nice. In a full, in full sun and a, and a well-drained soil, um, does really well. Hummingbirds uh, seem to like them. There are several of these uh, uh, hybrids. There's another one. A little farther down on the back side there, you see the red one? That's one called Scarlet O'Hara. Uh, that one really attracts hummingbirds. Uh, this one does to a lesser extent. Um, for those people with a really good design eye, uh, this is a great plant for, um, for using in combinations. It's got kind of a, a little bit of pink and then the yellow. And if you combine it with, you can combine it with some hot pinks and it really brings out the pink in here. You can combine it with yellows, you can bring out the yellow. The old uh, Calibrecoa terracotta, those colors that have kind of the pink and yellow in there, combine really well with this. Uh, Salvia, Sierra San Antone, which has all these similar colors, looks really good. Um, you know, white, perhaps not the best uh, combination for, but, uh, you know, what can you do? Um, <laughs> but, but really a great plant if you're a better designer than I am, uh, uh, better color person than I am. Really beautiful. You can grow it as a house plant as well, but uh, why would you want to? Flop it outside. <laughs> Dahlias are another one that, that folks up north, you know, dig up and store inside and do all that kind of stuff with. Um, we don't really need to. About a, a third of what you see in here, a third of the dahlias, uh, are are just um, seedlings. That's a seedling there, isn't that, isn't that gorgeous? That, that seedling. Um, lots of these guys and around here are seedlings. A lot of the single flowered ones are seedlings. These are are, are planted ones. Um, they are very happy here, as, as you can see. Um, and, and if you get ones like the, the Bishop series that has the dark foliage like you see here, um, and some of the classic series which has more of that smoky uh, uh, foliage, many of the seedlings will come up will have that same coloration. So, so it's uh, very nice. Um, Dahlias look really good now. We're going to get up into the 90s this week. They are going to go downhill very quickly. Um, they're, they're going to be finishing up flowering, and the foliage is going to start looking ratty, and they're really going to kind of collapse in on themselves, and that's okay. That's what they do. And then uh, once it gets cool again in the fall, they will pop back up. They will flower again um, really nice. So, so as long as you're not expecting this kind of color all summer long here, they're fantastic plants. And I really like plants that, that do that because that allows some of these other things, you know, like Alstromerias and uh, the, the Zephranthes and lilies and some other plants to come up and, and kind of take over the show. And then as those things are fading again, these come up and brighten up the, the fall again. So, so it's kind of, it's really nice. Do the deer like those? Do the deer like those? Can somebody answer like that? I don't know. They don't eat mine. They, they don't. There you go. <laughs> when they fade with the heat, yes. you just leave them, don't do anything. Cut them back. Cut them back. They'll, they'll, they, 
they kind of just almost disappear on their own. They'll, they'll start looking ugly. Let them go. Let them go until they're, um, you know, about a third dead back, and then just just whack them off. And they'll come. They'll come back up, and you'll have some foliage and some flowers over the summer, but not like this. They'll look kind of pitiful and weak, uh, and then they'll boom. They'll come back out really nice. Are these vegetatively propagated? Good question. Are these vegetatively vegetatively Propagated. Um, the named ones, yes, you, they, you root them from cuttings. They root really easily. Um, that, and that's how you do, do them from cutting. You do them from cuttings. But then they, they'll seed around also in here. And, you know, every once in a while, Tim gets very excited by a new one. And then I take and show him the list of 20 pages of dahlias and say, really? Do we need um, it, it, That one is really very nice. That, that one I just noticed this morning. Yeah. Tim's been gone a week. That's why he hasn't said anything to me about that. But that may be one that we hang on to. Another plant while I'm standing here. So this is what happens when you don't. I don't make a list. I just talk about things that interest me. Um, didn't notice it when I walked through before. How many people are familiar familiar with Lilium formosana? A couple people. Big tall lily gets taller than me. Flowers uh, first week of August every year. Um, this is actually uh, a different form. This is the high elevation form of Lilium uh, formosanum, called Lilium formosanum variety pricei. Uh, this is one we collected in Taiwan, and it stays much shorter. The literature will say about a foot tall, but it grows taller than a foot, as you can see. But if you have the true variety pricei, it'll flower much earlier. Smaller flowers. Uh, but, but it stays low, three, three feet or so tall, and it'll flower this time of year instead of August. So it's kind of nice to extend that, that season for it. Um, we were a little afraid, we planted the variety pricei here away from the regular lily and formosanum because we were afraid they'd cross. And we wanted to see if it was truly short. Some people say variety pricei is not a true variety. Uh, it's just the high elevation form, and it, if you bring it down low, it'll grow the same. But it does not. So we've We've uh, established that to our own satisfaction anyway. And we could plant them together because they're not flowering at the same time, so you wouldn't get any cross pollinators. The geophyte border here that I wanted to talk about, another Habranthus, just because this one is so different. Uh, this is um, Habranthus uh, texensis, um, the, uh, the copper lily. And you can see where it gets that name, that, that uh, kind of coppery yellow orange with almost a brownish on the outside kind of maroon brown uh, striping on the outside it's the only rain lily that I know of I'm pretty sure it's the only one that has anything resembling this coloration all the rest are pinks and whites uh, and yellows but not this kind of uh, coppery yellow and again you can see it's got kind of that little bit of nod which makes it a hebranthus not a zephyranthus um, and it'll seed around a bit and spread around, but really nice thing. Much finer foliage than the Russell Manning, much smaller flower. You only get one flower per scape on here typically. The Russell Manning, you can get as many as seven on, on a scape on it. Um, but occasionally you get two. I see a couple with, with a, another bud coming out. Um, but as a lot of these Zephranthes, a lot of times the folds will start going dormant when it flowers and the folds will pop back up and it kind of goes back and forth all summer long. And this is another one that will flower uh, after it gets some, some moisture uh, during, during the summer. So with all the rain we had, um, a lot of the Zephranthes have been flowering and a lot of the Hebranthus, so it's, it's been kind of a nice um, spring. And it's really interesting. You come out here, if we have a dry period like we typically do, you know, two, three weeks with no rain, come out here, if we get a rain, come out here about three days later and the whole front edge of this will just be Zephranthes in blue and there'll be pinks and whites and um, yellows. Uh, it's really quite beautiful. About three days after a good rain will we'll really bring them out. Questions? How do the rabbits like those really? <laughs> How do the rabbits like them? I, I'm, you know, wildlife stuff I'm not certain about. Uh, I don't know. Okay. I don't know. Huh? Not the Hebranthus rabbits? Yeah. There you go. Oh, okay. Perfect. Thank you. Cool. Now, those who come on a lot of tours with me know that I have I've said I'm not a big purple coneflower fan. 
Um, a lot of the old ones I just thought were not very good plants. Uh, but some of the new crop has just been fantastic. Some of the, the ones that are, have come out over the last uh, five, eight, ten years have really been nice. This little dwarf one, I really, I'm really fond of. It's it's actually a. Uh, it comes from uh, Kim's knee high from Kim Hawks. Uh, he used to be at uh, own uh, niche gardens. Um, she had a fantastic one, Kim's knee high. This is an improvement. It's one that's the cultivar is Cone Kim, uh, but it's sold as Panther Pink. Uh, I'm not sure why it didn't Pink Panther, but Panther Pink. Um, really nice deep uh, flower color much better flower color than just straight uh, echinacea purpurea or even um, Kim's knee high you get the great cones on there some of the dwarf uh, echinaceas you don't have the, the cone in the center isn't quite as nice um, but this has a really uh, nice one and it's and it's dwarf it stays you know this is about as tall as you'll ever see this one get um, really a uh, heavy heavy flower producer you can see the difference between really full sun and there were some plants in here and these these back here got a little shaded and you can see even still they, they're getting just a little bit more shade and it makes all the difference in the world um, between getting these plants out in full sun and getting them in some shade it'll keep flowering all summer long if you deadhead it'll do even better uh, you know if you don't deadhead it'll 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 the flowering will kind of slow down and you'll have the the, the black um, seed heads in there uh, which the birds like to eat if you're gardening for the birds don't deadhead it or um, you can do what what um, what I'll often do uh, at least at guards my own house I, I don't have enough sun for echinacea um, but deadhead it all summer long keep it flowering and then when you start getting into late summer leave it and let the seed heads go into fall when, when birds are looking for food. I figure they got lots of food out here um, during the summer. So that way you can keep it flowering over an extended period, but still feed the birds uh, in the fall. So sometime in, in say, uh, mid-August, just stop uh, deadheading it completely. Questions about echinaceas in general, or this one in particular? Deer probably love them. <laughs> Yes, they do. <laughs> if you don't want a gun, get a big dog. Bull Mastiff. <laughs> this is an onion. Onions are lovely flowering plants. Uh, we have some in our scree garden that will just absolutely knock your socks off in another uh, uh, couple of weeks, um, and some late in the uh, later on in the fall. This tall one, though, is is more a little bit more useful one. Uh, this is Allium amplosorum. Does anybody know what that is? This is that, when you get that um, elephant garlic, you know, you get the jumbo elephant garlic, that's what this is. So you can grow it as a, a, a vegetable plant. You can dig it up and get those um, bulbs in the, um, in the winter and replant some of them. And, and, but it's also a really nice flowering plant. It's not actually being used as nicely as it should be right here. We cleared out some plants here. Where you want this is, and, and we've got more growing, and this is what you want, some plants that are going to grow up like this tall and, and flower and be beautiful in front of it with the, this allium coming up behind it and giving some, um, some architecture to the garden, that, those nice round clusters. Now some of the onions have much bigger heads, the allium giganteum and some of those, uh, they don't always come back terribly well for us, whereas this one um, really does uh, do pretty well, even when it's being encroached on by uh, giant reed grass. Um, Pale flower color, not not the, the strongest flower color, but still those those really dense uh, round heads are, are awfully nice, and the bees like them, which is good. Does the foliage usually get ratty on the bottom when they come up? Yeah, yeah, the foliage usually once it starts flowering. It's, it's once it starts flowering, it'll get a little bit ratty. And uh, and what I'll do is uh, when the flowers fade, when they no longer look good, cut it all the way back down to the ground, all the way off. Um, not just the flower heads, and it'll put up some new foliage, which will look nicer. Um, if you're produ if you're growing this to produce to get the garlic from it, you may want to just cut off the flower stalks and leave the leaves, so you have more photosynthates. If you cut it all the way back, it has to expend some of that energy that would go into the bulb, putting up new foliage. All right.
No questions? Sorry. How long do those they bloom for? How long do they bloom for? Oh, they'll last for a good, uh, individual heads will last for about two weeks or so. But you see, like, this is just starting to open up. This one's a little bit farther past. Um, these are kind of in the middle. So you'll get some over time. And if you, if you dig it up, once you get a, a nice plant like this, you can dig it up and you can break apart that bulb. Uh, you want to make sure you get a little bit of that basal plate on each of those cloves and you can replant those. Now it'll take them a couple of years before they're flowering size. It won't be flowering size the next year. But you can take a big clump and break it into either, either break off you know, three or four cloves around the outside, plant those. The main clump will still probably flower the next year. The other ones will take them a couple of years. Or you can even just go through and cut it in half and cut that, that basal plate on the bottom in half or in quarters and replant that. And, and usually, if you have a big clump, you'll get flowers the next year. Other questions? Does it take pretty fertile soil? You probably can grow it anywhere, but it would yeah, really you can produce. Yeah, grow it most anywhere in, in sun. But yeah, it'll tolerate very fertile soils. Yeah, it'll do, do very well there. Uh, Yara, which you know, a lot of people Fine know the, um, the uh, taller, you know, yellow one. Mm -hmm. And there, there's really, there, there's quite a few Achilles uh, species out there, but the two that you see grown a lot are Achillea philopendulina and Achillea millifolium. Um, the philopendulina tends to be a clumping plant and the millifolium is spreading. This is obviously Achillea millifolium. It's really a kind of an unnamed one. We just have it as Montrose rose form. This came from Montrose Garden from Nancy Goodwin. Uh, really good color. Mm -hmm. This is another one of those Achilles or another one of those plants that often just leave me kind of, eh. You know, they, they, the, they'll come out and they'll start to look good and then they'll immediately wow. fade to kind of ugly mm -hmm. uh, with the exception of very few forms. Mm -hmm. This Montrose Rose form is really an outstanding one. Uh, it keeps the full color for a good long period. Even the fading flowers I think look good in, in kind of this mosaic of pink and light pink as they fade. Um, foliage stays looking good. A lot of them, the foliage gets really ratty on them. Um, but this stays looking looking um, really good uh, through the summer, and it'll keep flowering over a really extended period. It just keeps going and going and going, especially if you deadhead. Again, I, say, I keep I keep saying that, and just so you know, I don't deadhead anything in my garden <laughs> at all. Thank you. Ever. Thank you. That makes us feel better. <laughs> um, if you deadhead, it will flower longer. That's with almost all perennials. That's that's the way it goes. If you get rid of the, all that energy going into seed production, you will get more flower production. The plants want to uh, procreate. So if you get rid of the seed, they got to keep trying. So they keep keep flowering, keep flowering. Um, some will keep flowering all summer long. Some plants will just extend their flowering for a, a couple of weeks. Um, but I, I don't personally do that. Uh, plant lots of th different things and you get yeah. lots of flowers. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, but if you do, and you, you can just come in here and, and you know, you take out these as they fade and You'll get more, and usually that second flush, you'll have smaller flowers. You won't, you won't get the same thing as that first uh, really good flush. But you can do that. Where do you get them? Where do you get them? Well, I don't know if Nancy is selling this one um, now, and her when she's is she still selling things? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so on her open if days. If you go to if she you just had an open day, mm -hmm. if you go to Montrose Gardens during during the open days, um, you might be able to get it then. Um, I don't know who, if anybody, is growing this particular one. Uh, we sometimes propagate it and, and give it away, or, or uh, now we have the plant sale cart, we can sell them. Um, so we sometimes have them. I was thinking as I was going along that this would be a good one to put on the list. Mm -hmm. uh, so we may, we may do that. The plant behind you. This one. Philip Henshaw, is it? This one? Uh-huh. No, this is question about this plant. This is uh, tamarix, salt cedar. Uh, this one called, probably, this is probably pink cascade. I'm not 100% certain of that. Uh, terribly, terribly weedy plant in some <laughs> areas of the world. Not a weedy plant for us. Um, it's, a, it's a woody plant. It'll grow up into a pretty good sized tree and uh, it'll just be pink, just covering it. It looks like a conifer. That's why they call it salt cedar. It's not a conifer. Um, conifers don't have pink flowers. Um, 
but gets loads of flowers. The way we grow ours is to cut it back on occasion. Um, you can't see it, but we have big, thick, woody stems down here. We cut it back, flushes back out. We get this nice silvery blue foliage and um, the uh, pink flowers. Salt cedar will grow just about anywhere. It's called salt cedar. The cedar part is because the way it, the foliage looks. The salt part is because you can grow it just about in ocean, the ocean. Um, it, it's very, very cold tolerant. Doesn't, it's, it's, some of them are very heat tolerant. Um, sunny, inhospitable spots. Tamarix is an easy plant to grow. Not, not terribly popular in much of the United States. And uh, where it has been popular, it's, it's weedy. Mm -hmm. um, so, so you don't see a lot. But it's really, it's a great plant for us, especially if you cut it back, because it's always kind of leaning and flopping and um, not a strong wooded thing. So if you plan on cutting it back every year or two, just let it flush back out. It's perfect. Anybody want a variegated uh, china berry? <laughs> saw, saw one hand there. Amelia? Yeah, just wrap it in some wet paper towels before you go home. <laughs> that plant next to is that in the bathroom? This one over here. This is a Lespedeza. Oh, Lespedeza. Yeah, this is a uh, pink cascade, which is one of those plants that can't decide whether it wants to be a bush or a shrub. Um, kind of a, a woody type plant. Uh, with, with a lot of the Lespedezas, what we the Lespedezas, um, many of them are very, very uh, uh, daylight sensitive for flowering. So they, they flower when nights are a little bit shorter. In fact, we had one planted by one of our light bollards, and it never flowered because it was getting long days. We moved it, and all of a sudden it started flowering um, all the time. So we'll often with the Lespedezas, because we get enough warmth early enough. We'll get enough growth that when the, the, the day length is still short in the spring, early summer, it'll flower. You go farther north, they don't start growing until later, so they don't so by the time they start growing, the day length is too long for them to flower. And then in the fall is when you get your really big flower. So so we're lucky. A lot of these Lespedezas, like Pink Cascade, will get two uh, two flowers out of them. Um, does it make woody stems? Uh, the best way to deal with Lespedeza, unless you want a huge honking plant, is to cut it back every year during the winter. And one of the great things about uh, Lespedeza and cutting it back is um, the stems, once it goes, once it dies, this thing's all cascading out like this. In the winter, when it um, goes dormant, all those stems will curl up and all these little fine parts will curl in and it'll be this really upright kind of uh, uh, you know, it's like a, a spider that died. Everything kind of goes up like that. You cut those off and hang on to them. Put them, put them somewhere out of the way. Uh, and in the spring, when you have plants that grow up and flop, instead of getting metal stakes, you know, and peony rings and, and tomato cages in your perennial borders or in your vegetable garden, you take these and you shove the stems into the ground and then you have the, where it's curled over, curled over your plants and your plants will grow up through there and they look very natural. You don't even notice them very early. It, the British call it pea staking. They, they call it pea shrub. And when they talk about pea staking, that's what they're doing is, is using plants like this, like that. You can take other like twigs off of um, beech and birch and things like that and stick those to the ground and break them over. Uh, but this just looks really natural. It looks like you didn't cut a few things back last year before everything grows up through it. But it's a really nice natural way if you know you have things that, that flop. It's a really nice natural way to, um, to solve that problem. Okay. This plant that is spreading around here and in the, the pot here um, is a lobelia, believe it or not. For those of you who are only familiar with like the, the cardinal flower, lobelia cardinalis, our native um, lobelia, or, or maybe some of the blue ones, um, a lot of times people are surprised at, at lobelia. There are some tropical ones that have huge flowers, some southwestern ones. Uh, these uh, grow all over. This is one, Lobelia laxiflora variety angustifolia. And you can see that angustifolia, narrow leaf. You see where it gets that. And laxifolia, because um, the flowers kind of kind of dangle on there. This, this makes a, a little plant that, if you held the stems upright, would probably be about three feet tall, but they always seem to kind of lay down and go up, so they're about two feet. Um, and it flowers with these nice, uh, uh, long um, stemmed uh, flowers that are red with a little bit of yellow. Uh, there's, there's 
a selection that comes out of this uh, that's uh, called candy corn. It has a little bit larger flowers, foliage is a little bit different, it might be a hybrid, um, but, but really a kind of a, a cool plant. And it flowers over a really extended period uh, through most of the summer. It's a, a southwestern plant, which is part of the reason it does that. It's, um, you know, we have enough humidity and moisture that it'll keep flowering. In the southwest, it gets a little bit of flower out in the spring and then um, kind of shrivels up a little bit. Uh, really beautiful, um, beautiful foliage plant, you know, just looks nice on, along the edge and a pot, wherever, and, uh, and then those cool flowers. Um, once full sun, it'll tolerate a little bit of shade, but it'll flop even more, flower uh, less. Doesn't knock you out with the flowers because it is such, there's so much foliage on there and the flowers are kind of inside there, um, but still kind of a, a cool thing to um, get up close to it and look at. Is that as tall as it gets? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is about, it'll get a little bit taller, but then it'll kind of lay down a little bit. And that's, that's it always does that. Rebecca, Rebecca Maxima. A lot of people know Rebecca, you know, they're, they're uh, the Black Eyed Susans, these kind of things. This is one that's sometimes Sorry, called Elephant like Rebecca. Um, it's a, a kind of a southern, uh, south central native uh, composite uh, to the U.S. Makes these really big clumps of very tall flowers. And again, this is nice, kind of like that allium. You get that height and that flower early in the season. A lot of the tall things, it takes a long time for them to get tall, whereas this will start flowering um, early. Great big huge basal foliage. The, the leaves can be um, just uh, pretty enormous and always this, this light blue green which is, which is really nice. Um, before they start flowering you get really nice, uh, you get kind of clumps of the basal foliage and then as it goes up some of that basal foliage dies um, and it goes up. This is one that can stand a little bit of pea staking uh, or at least be a little farther back in the border on, right on the front edge. It's probably not the ideal spot for it. Um, again, if you deadhead, you'll continue to get flowers. If you don't deadhead, you get these, these will turn black. The petals will fall, these will turn black. It's, it's pretty showy. Um, it is one that you, if you want those stalks, you got to leave them pretty early. It won't keep flowering. You can deadhead it, get it to extend uh, uh, a couple weeks, but not, not into fall typically. Um, or if you don't care about the heads, you can cut it all the way back and you'll get a new flush of this basil foliage, which will look nice all, all summer long. And you'll get some flower stalks, but not, not a ton. Really cool plant. Good for containers. The foliage is good for containers. You can keep cutting it back and just keep that foliage uh, really nice. Robascum chaxii. I don't know how to pronounce it. Chaxii. C H A I X I I. Um, this is one of the mullins. They drive down the road. You see those things, big the little rosettes with big fuzzy leaves, some of their fuzzy silvery leaves. That's a verbascum. This is another one. Uh, some people consider this kind of weedy because it will um, seed around in the garden a bit. In fact, if you see the, the white with the little pink anthers back there, that's what was planted here. That's the, the, the uh, cultivar album, uh, the white flowered one. I actually like just the species, the yellow flowered one, better. Um, got those yellow flowers with a little bit of pink anthers in there, which is kind of nice bicolor effect. Um, bold foliage, uh, it'll pop up here and there, it'll seed a little bit. If it gets out of control, I don't think it's too bad to dig up. It does have a tap root, um, but this one doesn't, doesn't um, you know, go to China, so it's not, not too bad. Um, but it gives you that really strong verticality of the flowers uh, where the foliage uh, stays nice and low. Uh, very tough, that's why it's weedy, um, easy to grow, and it'll keep flowering over a long period. You can see, if, you, if you were to look in here, you'd see that there are flower buds that still haven't opened in here. It's not like one of those plants where you know, every flower down at the base opens all the way up to the top. It'll kind of flower, peek in and out here and there uh, throughout the plant. Verbascum is technically a biennial. Um, Chaxii will, will often live for multiple years, especially if once it's mostly done flowering, you cut off the flower spikes and don't let it uh, go to seed. Any other? They don't always fit into those boxes we like to put them in. But it, yes, it is technically a biennial.
a plant that Agastache, 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 however you want to pronounce it, um, a variety called Blue Boa, because um, it's got these really long um, kind of feathery flower spikes like a boa. Uh, this is a relatively new one. If you've grown Agastache Blue Fortune, uh, which a lot of people love or did love, never been terrible to me. I've never been a big fan of, of Blue Fortune. Way too much foliage for the amount of flowers in my mind. This blue boa really takes it up to a different level. Um, just the intense uh, tall flower spikes, great color, really great flower coverage on it. Uh, this one will tolerate a little bit of shade, certainly do much better in sun. Um, does want a pretty well drained soil, doesn't have to be bone dry like some of the Agastache, but does like, doesn't want to sit in the wet at all. Doesn't like wet feet. You see the bees love it. They're um, all over it uh, right now, uh, which is a good thing. As a, you know, so there are some neighborhoods in Raleigh that are trying to ban beehives. Uh, shouldn't be doing that. Um, it's a good thing to have bees out working your, your plants like this. Um, really easy. Uh, we really don't do anything to it. Just let it go. I suppose you could deadhead it. Uh, might take a while. Um, <laughs> probably a lot of the Agastaches, uh, especially the blue ones, will start looking a little sad. You can cut them back hard and let them re-sprout um, you know, after they finish flowering. Uh, that's that's about the extent that I do with, with perennials in terms of maintaining my yard is maybe cut them back one time mid-summer and let them regrow. Um, and this one will, would, would do well with that. Um, any of the ones that kind of spread, that, that also slows them down, and that's that's often a good thing. Questions? Questions about anything I didn't talk about that you'd like me to talk about? Care, specific plants, anything like that? Any recommendations for shade perennials? Any recommendations for shade perennials? I will do a whole tour on that <laughs> later on this summer, like maybe the August one. Have I already given you a tour nope. topic for August? You have now. August will be <laughs> shade perennials. Okay. How's that? Thank you. It's a little harder because when we do perennials, we always get a big crowd, and a lot of the shady areas are a little smaller, but that's okay. We'll charge admission. We'll charge admission. <laughs> Free for members. What kind of salvia? Okay. The blue. This is Salvia garnitica uh, Argentine Skies. Is that right? This is Ligonosa. That's going on. It's just a lighter blue. Than yeah, this is this is Argentine skies. It's a uh, really beautiful uh, salvia. If you if you really push it, this has been growing for a while, so the soil's a little lean right here. If you really push it, you can get much taller plants. Flowers heavily, spreads well, um, stays sturdy, stays upright, doesn't flop um, if it's in full sun. Uh, really nice one. So salvia garnetica, uh, Argentine skies. There are several of them. Black and blue has a black calyx. Blue, and there, there are a couple more, but just palings. Other questions? All right. Thank you. Well, thank you all for coming. Hope y'all take some time uh, seeing the rest of the arboretum today. It's really looking good. Thank you. And just ignore the weeds. <laughs>